we continue today in our series, The Making of a Disciple, and really we're walking through the Gospel of Mark and looking at some very concise lessons that he wrote to us about being a disciple of Jesus Christ. If you're sitting here today, if you're watching online, if you have received Christ as your Savior, your Lord and Savior, really what you're called to is to be a disciple. And that's the one thing that sometimes is hard to grasp, is being a disciple means leaving something behind to follow Jesus. It means making a sacrifice to follow Jesus. When we look at this scripture reading today, it was out of Matthew, right out of the Sermon on the Mount. Ultimately, the point of that particular reason, that particular reading, uh, reading rather, is you are the light of the world, but your light should shine on one specific thing, or rather, a person. The Bible is really clear about being a disciple versus just being a part of the crowd. A disciple versus being part of the crowd, and I want to focus that today as we are walking through the Gospel of Mark. He has a lot to teach in this story about being a crowd follower or being a disciple. There is a difference. There is another way we could put this. We, we talked about being a spotlight, but we can also say what's your spotlight on, but also what is your gravitational center as a person who's following Jesus? Because there's a difference between crowd and disciple when it comes to the gravitational center. I have here with me today a bicycle tire. Thank you, that was profound. <laughs> you know, wheels, it's really a wheel, it's more than just a tire. I should be clear about that. You know, a wheel hasn't changed much since it was invented. It's still round. It's still designed to help something move from point A to point B more efficiently. If, the we if something was shaped like this, it doesn't work so well. You're going to get pretty hung up. But a wheel is made to work efficiently, to move you from point A to point B. This particular one found a rut on Ponkin Road about three years ago. So we've had to work some things out with this one. But it operates the way that the wheels pretty much always operated. You have on this particular wheel, you got that outer tire. It has little grooves in it for traction, especially if there's weather. If there's no weather, you actually don't want the grooves in there if it's just dried out. You have the, the frame, the wheel actually here. You got the tire, you got the wheel. You have spokes. And you have the center hub. Your life could be compared to a wheel, sort of. You need the traction to keep you moving the direction that you need to go. You need that wheel that is your life that keeps turning, that keeps us moving. If we stop moving, what do we do? We die. You have the spokes. You could say that that keeps us connected to the center. We could say that for us as followers of Jesus, that's... You know, studying your Bible. Mm. That's prayer. Right. That's fellowship. Mm. That is worshiping together. That is being involved in service. That is any number of things that keeps us connected to the center, which is Jesus. Amen. Yeah. Everything has to revolve around Jesus. Amen. If the center of the wheel moved and it was sitting right here, what would happen? Accident. An accident, that's right. I can make that happen anyway. It has to be at the exact center if we're really going to be operating at the maximum efficiency that a wheel is supposed to work. Jesus has to be at the very center. 
not off to the side, not anywhere. Not, it can't be absent, and then the wheel doesn't work at all. Right. It has to be at the absolute center. Amen. And what our lives are like as disciples, it puts Jesus at the center. So we have a question to ask. Disciple of Jesus, what or who is your spotlight on? What is your gravitational center? Mm, amen. Mark's teaching us today. It comes, this story we're going to read, it comes right after Jesus has taught with authority in the synagogue and he's cast out demons and he's healed people of diseases. It comes after he has healed Peter's mother-in-law, after people have lined up for hours outside the house he was staying in to be healed. And we come to Mark chapter 1, verse 35 through 39. It reads, In the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is looking for you. But he said to them, Let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also, because for this purpose I have come forth. And he was preaching in their synagogue throughout all Galilee and casting out demons. The Bible tells us everyone was looking for Jesus that day. We could break everyone into a couple of categories. You had the crowd, and you had the disciples. What's the difference? Well, why was the crowd looking for him? He was gone from their presence, and they wanted to find him, but they went to the place where they had seen him work and talk. They looked for him to hear what he had to say again and to see what he had to do. There's a big difference because the disciples knew where Jesus was somehow. By this point in Mark, by the way, we've already covered a lot of time in Mark 1 because Mark moves very quickly, actually. So there's a fair amount of time that's covered in that one chapter. But by now we know the disciples are probably used to, word, to, to Jesus and kind of how he's getting familiar with how he operates. Either they knew intuitively where to look for him or Jesus told them, hey, this is where I'm going to be. Because obviously they're the ones that found him. But they're the only ones that also left the city to look for him. They knew where he was. And they were there to follow him while the crowd was there to watch him. Mm. Don't lose that point, disciple of Jesus. The disciples versus the crowd. The crowd was looking for Jesus because of what he did. A disciple looked for Jesus because of who he was. Amen. Yes, sir. There's a difference. Yes, sir. Jesus made plain why he wanted to go from isolation to synagogues and other towns in Galilee because he wanted to replicate what he had done in Capernaum already. He needed to preach, cast out demons, and heal in new places. There are important lessons that Mark is teaching disciples here. The crowd looked for Jesus to see what he would say and do. The disciples looked for Jesus because of who he was and they wanted to just be with him and follow him. Amen. It also teaches us about Jesus' strategy. Jesus' strategy is frequently go and break new ground. Mm. Now sometimes, if we're followers of Jesus and we follow him to break new ground, it's a little uncomfortable, isn't it? Because it's not what you're familiar with. Right, right. It's not what you know right in front of you. Right. It may hurt a little bit. You might have to give something up. But followers of Jesus, if you're looking for Jesus to be him, be with him, then you also look for Jesus to follow him where he goes. Amen. And sometimes that's not where you want to go. Right. So do you look for Jesus for what he does and what he says, or do you look for him, disciples, because you love him and want to be with him and you want to follow him? Right. Do you look for him because he heals or because he is the healer? Mm. Okay. Do you look for him because he loves 
or because he is love? Right, right. Do you look for him because he enacts justice or because he is justice? Amen. And do you look for Jesus because of what he created or because he is the creator? Amen. Disciple, if Jesus is the center of your life, you're looking for him as a disciple because of who he is. Because you want to follow him Amen. wherever he goes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Not just because he does what you want him to do. Right, right. So make Jesus, first of all, teaches Mark's teaching us, make Jesus the gravitational center. Make him the spotlight of your life. Love him because of who he is. Follow him where he leads. And don't fear. Don't fear to break new ground with Jesus and go new places. Amen. Because that new ground is going to amaze you. It's going to move you somehow. And that's what happens next. In 1975... There's a child by the name of Raymond Dunn, Jr., born in New York State. The Associated Press reports that at his birth, a skull fracture, oxygen de deprivation, caused severe mental disabilities. As Raymond grew, the family discovered further impairments. His twisted body would seize up, and he would suffer 20, up to 20 seizures a day. Mm, I see. He was blind, he was mute, he was immobile, he had severe allergies. The only thing he could eat was the meat-based formula made by Gerber Foods. Wow. In 1985, Gerber stopped making that formula that Raymond lived on. Wow. Carol Dunn scoured the country to buy what stores had in stock, she accumulated cases and cases, but in 1990, the supply ran out. In desperation, she appealed to Gerber for help. Without this food, Raymond would starve to death. But the employees of the company listened. In an unprecedented action, volunteers donated hundreds of hours to bring out old equipment set up production lines, obtained special approval from the USDA, and produced the formula for one boy. Wow. In January 1995, Raymond Dunn Jr., known as the Gerber boy, died from his physical impairments. But during his brief lifetime, he called forth a wonderful thing called compassion. Wow. Compassion. By definition, it's the sympathetic pity and concern for the sufferings and misfortunes of others. It's something that moves people. It's something that moves Jesus in this story. We read in Mark chapter 1, 40 through 42, that a leper came to Jesus, imploring him, kneeling down to him and saying to him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus, moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. As soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. I am amazed that we don't read that Jesus is moved to compassion. I'm not saying he wasn't moved to compassion before because he obviously healed people before this time. But for some reason, Mark waits to now and to say something like this. He's moved to compassion to do what? It says to clean the man, basically. Mm. Now, that's interesting that he uses this word to be cleansed. We have a person here who is a leper. He is an outcast. According to the old Levitical laws... He wasn't even supposed to be with people who weren't sick like he was. If you go back in the story, Jesus heals people of other diseases and people who had demons. It was okay to bring those people with demons and other diseases to Jesus in the open public. But if you're a leper, you were unclean and couldn't go there. And how this person got to Jesus without the Bible telling us who he had to get through to even get to him. The Bible doesn't really tell us that part. 
But that's where he was known, obviously. He, Jesus was known to teach. He was known to cast out demons. Somehow this man knew, kind of like the disciples, where to find Jesus. And he went and found him, much like others had done in Capernaum. But this guy wasn't supposed to do that. He was supposed to stay outside the camp and yell, unclean, unclean. And this leper gets to Jesus. This is an act of desperation. Who knows who he had to sneak by to get to him. Hmm. Hope nobody feels they have to sneak by us to get to Jesus. Come on, preacher. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He gets to Jesus. He implores. He knows. He needs Jesus. Jesus is his one and only hope. He wants to be clean. It's interesting. The text here says it like this. You see, here's the thing. If it says Jesus heals somebody, use another word, therapeutic, where we get the word therapeutic. But in this case, it's another word entirely, katharizo. It's a reminder again to the Jews that there's a law that they're subject to in this case. Leviticus 14 tells us what it is. Now the leper, on whom the sore is, his clothes shall be torn, his said head shall be bare, and he shall cover his mustache and cry, Unclean, unclean. He shall be unclean. All the days he has the sore, he shall be unclean. He's unclean and he shall, as if he had to say it at enough times, right? He's unclean. He shall dwell alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp, isolated from spouse, from family, from community and its resources, not being able to approach the sanctuary and the mercy seat. Hmm. Imagine the only people you get to see are the other people who are sick and also unclean. It's like being lost. It's like being dead already. The disease itself is a death sentence. You're without community. You're without access to important resources. He didn't need to just be healed. He had to be cleansed. Amen. Amen. And Jesus is moved by compassion to cleanse him. To touch the man that no one else would touch. Mm. He made contact with the one others would avoid. And Jesus says something that no one else would ever say in this position. Be clean. You're cleansed. He wasn't just healing the leper. Jesus was reversing an ancient curse of uncleanliness and all that came with it. Jesus was giving this man back his life, Amen. his home, his family, his community. And why? Why? Because he was moved by compassion. Amen. There's something Mark here is teaching about Jesus. Because Jesus' compassion moved him to do what others wouldn't do. It moved him to get past the ancient curse of uncleanliness. He had the power not only to teach. He had the power not only to cast out demons. He had not just the power to heal. He had the power to make you clean. In a way no one else could make you clean. Jesus wasn't subjected to the Levitical law, was he? Why? Because he wrote it. Amen. He had power over everything the law even addressed. Disciple of Jesus. What do we learn from this? Does the compassion of Jesus move you to do what others wouldn't do? Does the compassion of Jesus even move you to do the kinds of things that other religious folk wouldn't do? Let then the power of Jesus teach us that we have the power through Jesus over demons, sickness, things okay by the rules to be around, but you also have the power over that which people tell you you shouldn't even be around. You have the power to bring people to Jesus for forgiveness. You have the power to restore lives in the family and in the community. Isolation has no power over a disciple. We learn here, throw your dependence on the one with the power. Don't throw your dependence on the law. Throw your dependence on the author of the law. Amen, amen. Disciple, we love Jesus because of who he is. We follow Jesus because of where he leads. We break new ground with Jesus because we let his compassion move us. Amen. And we let his power work through us. Amen. 
That's what a disciple does. Yes, sir. There was a, a song. I've talked about road trips before. We spent a lot of time listening to very strange songs on our road trips when I was a kid. You ever heard of Brady Stevens? Yeah. yeah. I have a lot of those memorized to this day because of road trips. I can't get them out of my head. Sometimes I find myself singing them and my wife's going, what are you doing? So thanks for that. He had this one song called The Do Right Family. It essentially pokes fun at religious stereotypes of these old-time country churches that had a culture of bringing the fire and brimstone down on anybody who did wrong. That's why they're called the do-right family. And in the middle, about two and a half minutes into this song, Brother Thurman breaks out in preaching. Okay. And he breaks out in the middle of this song and during an all-night sing session of the Do Right Family Singers. Flock, <laughs> I just want to say a few words about discotheques. <laughs> people in there smoking, people in there drinking, people in there dancing. I tell you, them discotheques, nothing but a Sodom and Gomorrah. Mercy. And he looks to Virgil, the bass singer, and says, where are you going, Virgil? And Virgil says, I'm going to a discotheque. <laughs> you know, it, it's a funny song. Virgil's found this more attractive than sitting here in the church singing. But there's something almost rightly illustrated here. And as a kid, I got the song, believe it or not, because I remember the testimony sometimes of people who talk on and on about their sinful lives and spent five seconds saying, talking about the one who changed them. Mm. Wow. They found the Lord, and that was it. Yeah. Huh. And it looked like they were sucking on lemons when they said they found the Lord. <laughs> you know, if you glorify something that shifts the spotlight off Jesus, something is wrong. Right, right. If you glorify something that takes the spotlight off Jesus, the center is ruined. Mm. Amen. Mark 1, 43 to 45 continues the story. We've learned that a disciple follows Jesus and is with Jesus because of who he is. We follow him into unknown territories sometimes. We're moved by compassion. We're moved to do things others wouldn't do. But the story continues after Jesus has been moved by something that others wouldn't, he does something others would not do. It says he strictly warned the man, the leper, and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go your way, show yourself to the priest, and offer for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded as a testimony to them. However, he went out, began to proclaim it freely, and to spread the matter, so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the city, but was outside in deserted places, and they came to him from every direction." What that have to do with anything? Well, he says, go your way, show yourself to the priest, and offer the sacrifices for cleansing that Moses commanded. Clearly, Jesus is not here to disobey the Mosaic law. Otherwise, he wouldn't say to this man, go do the Mosaic law. So he's not disobeying this. He didn't have a problem, however, with breaking traditional addendums. But what we find here is that it doesn't tell us all the details entirely, but he's saying, go back and do this. If you go back into Leviticus 14, it talks about what the man would have to do. He had to isolate him, go find the priest. The priest would actually have to come out to him and inspect it. This is just to make a long story short, because this is getting long already. He'd come out and inspect it, and the man had to wait another seven days and get inspected again, and they had to go through sacrifices. They had to go through a sin offering, and they had to go through a burnt offering, and they had to go through a, a food offering symbolizing atonement and cleansing. Jesus, though, clearly had the power to heal and to cleanse. Was this for the man who was already clean and well, or was this for the priest? This is a testimony supposedly to the priest, I believe. 
It's a way to say to him, here's the evidence. There is a man who is unclean and is now healed and clean. There's a man that has gone through something extraordinary. Clearly, the priest would have asked the man, who healed you? How did this even happen? And at the time, the evidence would be clear based on the testimony of a cleansed leper, only a Messiah could do this. Amen. You see, Jesus wasn't out to defy Mosaic law. He was out to fulfill it. Amen. Jesus wasn't out to defy the priests. He was there to reach them. Amen. But the man just couldn't stand it. So he goes out, speaks freely of it before he ever gets to the priest. And now everybody knows about it. People in Capernaum know about it. People in all the other towns know about it. The leper obviously wasn't just in the city close by where he could find the priest. He had to go everywhere else. And then he would have had to go everywhere else where they weren't even supposed to let him in. So how this message gets out there, he has to go through efforts to go out and tell people about this. But he's able to do it, and he draws enough attention to himself in all these places, he gets the crowd back out. I imagine a man so desperate for community that he was willing to seek it wherever he could, but I also think we have a man here who kind of loved being part of the story. And that's okay. But for a moment, Jesus wasn't at the center anymore. The man being a part of the story was at the center. And now the way Jesus wants the testimony and the story to be clear has been compromised and everyone's crowding around. He can't even get to the cities that he just a few verses earlier told the disciples that he needed to go to. He can't even get there because they're all coming out to him in droves. Now, it's not that Jesus can't use this, but that wasn't what he had asked him to do. Mark teaches us again here, Jesus came to fulfill and complete the law. Matthew 5, 17, don't think I've come to destroy the law of the prophets. I came not to destroy, but to fill. The law says go through the ritual, but only God could cleanse. And the man came back cleansed. Jesus came to teach, cast out demons, heal, and cleanse, but he came to reach not only those with obvious needs, but even those with the less obvious needs. He came to reach the common man and the priest, the poor and the elite. But the story has to be about Jesus. Amen. Even for those who receive the miracle, the story has to be about Jesus. Amen. He has to be the one in the spotlight. Amen. And he has to be the one to define how the story is told. Right. <laughs> Disciple of Jesus. Jesus came to complete the law for you. It isn't something you could do. Only Jesus could do that. You need not try to replace what only Jesus can do. Amen. Jesus came to reach everyone sitting here, the rich and the poor, the elite and the outcast, the sick and the well, those who think they don't need him, and those who know they're desperate for him. No matter what your story is, no matter what Jesus has done for you, don't ever forget, he's not only the center of the story, he is the story. Amen. Yes, sir. So let his story be told in the way he wants it to be told. You can, you can have the best tread on the tires. God can give you everything you need for success in this life for success in your community, for success in your family. You can have the strongest wheel. Your framework can be strong. You may be healthy physically, emotionally, spiritually, mentally. Your connectors may be great. You may be studying your Bible. You may be praying regularly. You may be worshiping. You may be serving. You may be the whole wheel, a whole life healed by the Master. But Jesus, if this wheel's going to work, if you're going to work as a disciple, Jesus has to be at the center. Amen. Amen. He must be the one who's talked about when your story is told. Otherwise, it's all wrong. Amen. The wheel might turn, but it won't turn the way it should. So put your trust 
in Jesus. Amen. Make Him disciple in your spotlight. Make Him your gravitational center. Disciple of Jesus. Look for Jesus because you love Him and want to be with Him. Amen. Go to Jesus to follow Him where He leads. And that means breaking new ground, letting His compassion move you, letting His power work through you. And remember, Jesus is always the story. Amen. 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 Our Father in heaven, may you be in our spotlight. And may you be our center. We give you our life. May we follow you, Jesus, as your disciples. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.